The edge of business, which is stage three proceedings on the Gender Representation on Public Boards Scotland Bill. And in dealing with the amendment, members should have the bill as amended at stage two, that is Scottish Parliament Bill 16A, the marshalled list and the groupings. The division bell will sound and proceedings will be suspended for five minutes for the first division of the afternoon and the period of voting for the first division will be 30 seconds. Members who wish to speak in the debate on the group of amendments should press their request to speak buttons as soon as possible after I call the group. And I call amendment one in the name of the cabinet secretary grouped with amendments two, three, four and five and the Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 1 and to speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, President Officer. I'm pleased to have reached Stage 3 of the Gender Representation on Public Boards Scotland Bill this afternoon, uh, with only a small number of technical amendments to be considered. The Bill sets a, a gender representation objective for public boards, that 50% of their non-executive members are women, an objective which I'm pleased to say has met with almost unanimous cross-party support. This support speaks to what is at the heart of this bill, which is equality for women. The amendments, presiding officer, I'm speaking to this afternoon are all technical amendments to Schedule 1, intended to ensure consistency and to add one public authority. Amendments 1, 3 and 5 amend the entries in Schedule 1 for health boards, the National Library of Scotland and special health boards to ensure that the excluded positions for these boards are consistent with those on the boards of other public authorities. There is a great deal of variation in the composition of the boards of our public authorities and in the arrangements for determining membership. In some instances, a board will require that people holding certain positions in another organisation or forum are members or include members who are directly elected or nominated to the board. These positions are excluded from the bill in order to avoid interfering in elections or in other selection processes. Amendment 2 adds the Independent Living Fund Scotland to the list of public authorities covered by the bill. Amendment 4 is a minor technical amendment to add an SSI number to the entry for the Scottish Social Services Council, again for consistency. Presiding officer, I move and ask members to support amendments 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5. Thank you. I call Mary Fee. Thank you, um, presiding officer. I'm happy to support all of the amendments in, in the group. Um, as has been previously stated, amendments 1, 3 and 5 along with 2 and 4 are minor amendments which will improve the clarity of the Gender Representation Bill by ex explicitly excluding individuals and including organisations. It adds further clarity um, to the legislation. Amendment 1 amends the entry for health boards to exclude sp specific members and Amendment 3 amends the entry again to exclude specific members from the National Library of Scotland. And Amendment 5 would amend um, again to make an exclusion. Amendment 2 adds the newly established Independent Living Fund for Scotland to the list. And Amendment 4, as the Cabinet Secretary has said, is a small technical amendment related to the entry for the Social Services um, Council. And during the committee evidence sessions, there was a call from many witnesses for the bill to be as clear as possible to ensure that it was well enforced. And these minor amendments strengthen the bill and improve its clarity by providing greater detail in the wording. And again, I'm happy to support. And I call on Jamie Green. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Just a very uh, brief uh, comment to say that these benches will be supporting the amendments uh, as they are largely technical in nature. Thank you. Thank you. Does the Minister wish to make any comments in winding up? No. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. In that case, the question is that Amendment 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Can I call Amendments 2, 3, 4 and 5, all in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and all previously debated? Could I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move Amendments 2 to 5 on block? Moved on block. Can I ask any member, does any member object to the questions being put on block? No one does. In that case, the question is that Amendments 2 to 5 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. That ends consideration of amendments. Now, as members will be aware, at this point in proceedings, I'm required under standing orders to decide whether or not any provision in the bill relates to a protected subject matter. 
that is, whether it modifies the electoral system or franchise for Scottish parliamentary elections. If it does, the motion to pass the bill will therefore require support from a supermajority of members. In this case, in my view, no provision of the gender representation on public boards re relates to a protected subject matter. Therefore, the bill does not require a supermajority at stage three. So the next item of business is a debate on motion 10159 in the name of Angela Constance on the gender representation on public boards Scotland bill at stage three. Could I invite all members who wish to speak in this debate to press their request to speak buttons now? And I call on the Cabinet Secretary, Angela Constance, to speak to and move the motion. Thank you, President Officer. I'm delighted to open the Stage 3 debate on the Gender Representation on Public Boards Scotland Bill this afternoon. This bill will make Scotland the only country in the United Kingdom with a statutory objective for women's representation on public sector boards. It is unacceptable for women to still be underrepresented in senior positions in the boardroom, to still be paid less than their male counterparts, to still be subjected to sexual harassment and violence. And young women growing up in Scotland today should not have to accept these things as inevitable. Women, as we know, are not a minority. In fact, women represent the majority of the population in Scotland at nearly 52%. And our voices should be heard and need to be heard in decision-making spaces, whether that is in the boardroom or indeed in the floor of this chamber or elsewhere for that matter. And we know that greater diversity in the boardroom also leads to better performance by encouraging new and innovative thinking and better decision-making. In other words, it's the smart thing to do as well as the right thing to do. The Gender Representation on Public Boards Scotland Bill sets an objective for public boards in Scotland that 50% of their non-executive members are women. And it puts a duty on Scottish ministers and public authorities to encourage women to apply for board positions. The bill also requires that if there are two or more equally qualified candidates for a position, a woman should be appointed if doing so will help the board to meet its 50% objective. But I want to make this absolutely crystal clear because one of the most common arguments that I've heard from those who don't favour this legislation is that appointments should be made on merit. Well, appointments to our public bodies are made on merit and will continue to be made on merit. And we want to have the very best people to sit in Scotland's public boards, people with the right skills and the right experiences. And that means ensuring we are reaching out to and attracting uh, diverse and talented people, women included. It is when boards don't reflect the diversity of Scotland's communities that we should be concerned about merit. And let me also be clear to those who have wrongly portrayed this bill as seeking to impose quotas when it does not. It clearly sets out a 50% gender representation objective and requires steps to be taken in order to meet the objective. Poseidon officer, I am very grateful to the members and clerks of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee who scrutinised the bill at stages one and stages two. Our engagement with the committee has been very constructive and very helpful, and I believe that the bill we have before us now is stronger as a result of that engagement. I would also like to thank all of those individuals and organisations such as Women 5050 and in Gender who provided written and oral evidence to the committee. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, I also want to thank that committee, as well as the Finance Committee and the Commissioner for Ethical Standards in Public Life in Scotland. We are in an enviable position in Scotland right now in terms of the gender balance of ministerial public appointments. There has been a, a lot of positive progress made. In 2004 5 34.5% of regulated ministerial appointments were held by women. This has now increased uh, to over 45%. But that change hasn't just happened uh, by accident. It is down to the shared ambition and action of all of those involved in public appointments, ministers, the commissioner's office, the Scottish government's public appointments team and public authorities. And I know that a number of stakeholders have also been 
instrumental in challenging and helping us to make our appointments process more inclusive and we benefit greatly from applicants themselves taking the time to give us their feedback. Our approach has been shaped by the progress made to date and the commitment and energy of public authorities and others. Certainly. Jamie Green. I do thank the Cabinet Secretary for taking intervention. Uh, on that very point, uh, and I should add my welcome to the progress, significant progress that has been made to date, um, why the Cabinet Secretary feels the need to use legislation to go that extra four percentage points further to get to the 50%. It's a genuine question. I'd be happy to hear uh, the response. Minister, Cabinet Secretary. So, you know, so I think it's um, important to recognise the strength of our commitment and this Parliament's willingness to legislate because it will send a very strong message about how strongly we value equality of opportunity and how it should be embedded in our culture and our aspirations and also how we do business and how we operate. And this legislation is important because it means that our direction of travel is now firmly secured for the future. That's why we need legislation. And as I have often said, this is about locking in the gains that we have worked hard to achieve and working harder to achieve further progress. And I often quote Zadie Smith, uh, who says, progress is never permanent, will always be threatened, and so must be redoubled, restated, and reimagined if it is to survive. So I am clear, presiding officer, that legislation is the only way we will achieve and maintain women's equal representation uh, on public boards. Presiding officer, at stage two, the Scottish Government lodged a, a number of amendments uh, directly in response to the committee's uh, recommendations. We have introduced uh, a new duty on the Scottish Government to produce statutory guidance to support the implementation of the bill and to report to Parliament on the operation of the Act every two years at a minimum. And we also, I'm pleased to say, accepted Mary Fee's amendment to add a definition of women to the bill so that it was inclusive of trans women uh, without the need for them to provide uh, a gender recognition certificate. Uh, and we did this because we want this bill to be breaking down barriers and not to be creating barriers. And I am very grateful to Mary Fee who has advocated passionately uh, for the bill to be inclusive of trans women uh, and of course to the Scottish Trans Alliance uh, for their support uh, and for their expertise. I was, also, I was also pleased to accept two amendments from Alex Cole Hamilton, uh, both aimed at making crystal clear that this bill is not intended in any way to inhibit action to tackle the underrepresentation of other groups of people on public boards. And I remain confident that the positive impact of this legislation will not only be felt by women, but by other groups who are underrepresented too, disabled people, minority ethnic people, and also younger people. Because we also want to ensure that our boards reflect the myriad eh, of people's backgrounds and experiences. Now, of course, no element of gender inequality exists in isolation. Eh, the lack of female representation on boards is a symptom as well as a cause of wider gender inequality. So all of the steps that we are taking to promote gender equality across society more generally, such as tackling violence against women, both through legislation and by uh, challenging and changing culture, addressing gender stereotyping, investing in childcare, tackling persistent pregnancy and maternity discrimination, and appointing the First Minister's new Advisory Council on Women and Girls, all should support actions that enable women to play an equal part in businesses, in the boardroom, and indeed the workplace. During... Uh, yes? Kezia Dugdale. Thank you, President Officer. Given the Cabinet Secretary's laid out so clearly the strength of this bill and what it will do to deliver equality for women, could she share with us any understanding she might have of why the Tories are so steadfast against it? Cabinet Secretary. President Officer, uh, it's with disappointment I can say to Ms Dugdale that I can share no understanding uh, of why the Tories have refused to uh, support this bill. I have said before that I think it's misguided of the Tories. 
I think they have misunderstood what this bill is about and how the, the actions in this bill will proceed. I don't know whether that's just misguided uh, or whether it's uh, malicious, but I hope uh, that during the course of the date, uh, that this debate today, that, that the Tories will have cause uh, for reflection because it would be great, it'd be a great message to send forward, particularly to women and girls grown up in Scotland today that when it comes to advancing gender inequality in Scotland, that this parliament uh, stands united. Yeah. So, you know, so during the stage one debate, we talked about this bill being a moment. Uh, I very much believe it is. Is it a panacea for women's equality? Well, of course not. Does it mean that we can all sit back now and stop fighting for equality? Well, absolutely not. But I wholeheartedly believe that this is a moment that the Parliament can be proud of. This is especially true as we think of the women who campaigned uh, nearly 20 years ago to make sure women played uh, an equal part uh, in the new devolved Parliament. And the Scotland Act uh, passed in 2016 gave us a, a tiny part uh, of equality legislation but it gave us, I believe, a big opportunity, a big opportunity to show how we can use the powers at our disposal uh, to create a fairer, more equal country. And I believe that this afternoon we've done that. In moments like this, it is right to look at where we've come from and what we've achieved. This year is an important year for women's history. It is the centenary of the first women in Britain getting the vote eh, and women being allowed to stand for election to Parliament. And we will take the opportunity over the year to celebrate and reflect on the historical importance of these firsts, the events that led up to them and the women who helped to make them a reality. Without their sacrifice and tenacity, we wouldn't be having this debate at all. So, presiding officer, there is a, a time to reflect but there is also a time to act. And the best way of honouring uh, those women, in my opinion, is to make damn sure that we keep believing in equality for women and that we keep fighting for it. That we move from firsts to lasts, uh, the last time that we need to take action to remedy or mitigate the inequality that women face, to reach a point where women can take their rightful place in society that values their contribution equally. So on that point, presiding officer, I move that the gender representation on public boards Scotland bill be passed. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll call on Annie Wells. Thank you. Mm. Thank you, presiding mm -hmm. Thank you. I don't think mm. Thank you, presiding officer. Um, mm. I did want to take part in this debate today, although you can see that I may struggle slightly. Um, during the stage one debate, I outlined the reasons why I could not support the gender representation on public boards bill. And, sorry, I want to again stress... Would the member like to take a drink of water and just yes, see you? Maybe. Take your time. <clears throat> I've actually lost my voice, I think. <clears throat> Do you want to keep trying, Miss Bells, or...? I don't know if I'm going to be able to. Open, perhaps, if someone else would. Sorry, point of order first. Would you want to... Just to ask the presiding officer if it would be acceptable for somebody else if she's got a written speech course, to yeah. read it for her. Thank you for that point of order. I was just about to ask the same thing. Um, can I just ask Ms. Wells, uh, would you like to continue? Would you like someone else to open? Would you like to have a pause? We'll, I'll move to the, the Labour speaker and then come back to one of the Conservative speakers. I don't think I'm going to be able to. So if I could ask Alison Harris. Right, so you, you want Alison Harris to speak on your behalf. Um, Ms Harris, would you like a few moments? I'll, what I'll do is I'll move to the Labour openers and I'll come back to you if that's okay. Thanks, Ms Wells. I, I think it's noted for the record that you did wish to speak on this and that despite uh, personal difficulties, you did persevere. But thank you very much. Thank you. So I now call on Monica Lennon to uh, speak to the bill. <coughs> Thank you, presiding officer. I've quickly had a sip of water and I seem to be uh, speaking fine. I um, hope we hear uh, from Annie Wells through the medium of Alison Harris very shortly. Um, I'm pleased to speak in support of the gender representation on public boards bill today. And I'd like to begin, like the cabinet secretary did, by uh, paying tribute to the Qualities and Human Rights Committee for all of their diligent work 
and all the other stakeholders, but also to thank the Cabinet Secretary herself for her leadership on this important issue. I firmly believe in the effectiveness of using positive action to increase women's representation. The Scottish Labour Party's record on using positive action is strong to further women's representation, and that includes our use of all women shortlists. It's consistently been shown that positive action is the only measure which works and substantively increases the number of women in politics. Voluntary measures simply don't have the same effect and preserve the status quo. And like many colleagues across the chamber, I'm a proud supporter of the Women 5050 campaign, co-founded by my colleague Kezia Dugdale. As I set out in my contribution to the stage one debate on the bill, it is a sad and stubborn fact that women remain underrepresented at practically every level of public life in Scotland, whether that be in the Scottish Parliament, the UK Parliament, our local councils, the media, and yes, on our public boards too. Women make up half of the population, we're not a minority, so it shouldn't need saying that we should also make up half of the, the decision makers too. So the move to make it a legal obligation on Scottish ministers and public bodies in Scotland to improve the gender balance of our public boards, we believe is a welcome step. It is far from a panacea for solving the issues of women's inequality, but it's nonetheless important to ensure that the public bodies which oversee our services funded by the taxpayer should reflect the citizens they serve. Good governance can only occur if public bodies are accountable to and representative of those they are appointed to serve. It's also very clear that aside from the Conservatives, although they've got time to change their mind, there is widespread agreement amongst the rest of the parties on the need for the bill. I'll focus the remainder of my comments today on the substantive content of the bill and the work of the committee at stage two. Having read the committee report and the bill as amended, we are reassured that the issues which were raised during stage one have been satisfactorily resolved. Specifically, I congratulate Alex Cole Hamilton on his amendment regarding clarification of the tiebreaker concern. We shared the concerns during stage one that a potential unintended consequence of the bill could be the elevation of gender at the expense of other protected characteristics. This was also expressed by groups including Inclusion Scotland during the stage one evidence sessions. And it's a very valid concern that those with disabilities or other protected characteristics under the Quality Act 2010, including race or religion, would run the risk of being forgotten or sidelined by this legislation unless language was clarified. The bill now clarifies that protected characteristics refer to those listed under the Equality Act and that if there are two equally qualified candidates, the position may be given to someone who is not a woman if the other individual has another protected characteristic. Improving women's representation means very little if the only women being promoted are mainly middle-class white women from similar backgrounds and a similar outlook. Improving representation needs an intersectional approach and will only lead to meaningful change if boards are committed to changing culture. Presiding officer, I know in the chamber today there's been further scrutiny of Police Scotland and the Scottish Police Authority, and I'm mindful from my uh, time on the Public Audit and post legislative Scrutiny Committee, where we heard from Moy Ali, who's a, a BME woman, who sat on the Scottish Police Authority board. Moy is, by all accounts, a very experienced and respected board member, but she was treated quite awfully on her time on the SPA and in evidence to our committee. Um, she agreed that she had been bullied and when I asked her if all the things that had happened to her would have happened if she were a man, she said no and she gave examples of um, similar actions taken by her and male colleagues but she was the only one who was treated a certain way. That, that's evidence to the committee and it's this kind of high profile women's voice on a public board not being valued. And whilst I'm not saying that's the experience of every woman in public boards, the point I'm trying to make is that it does draw attention to the risk of a culture which can discourage women from applying to these very positions in the first place. So there's certainly, in my view, a lot more work to be done to ensure that boards are leading inclusive recruitment processes and that increasing representation leads to meaningful culture change. The Cabinet Secretary has already paid tribute to my colleague uh, Mary Fee and the Scottish Trans Alliance. A further strength of the bill has been the clarification of the term women 
Amendment Tenant Stage 2 in, in Mary Fee's name adds a definition to the bill to ensure that legislation is inclusive of trans women, including those who do not have a gender recognition certificate, and that is important. The Scottish Government amendments in the name of the Cabinet Secretary at Stage 2 are very welcome. The guidance for public authorities on how to deal with a tiebreaker and appoint candidates um, by the amendment to Section 4. And commitment that the Government will also be committed to reporting on the progress of the legislation, legislation is reassuring and will allow Parliament to scrutinise its effectiveness. So in light of the Stage 2 amendments, we are more than satisfied that the concerns raised during the initial evidence sessions have been addressed. This bill is sensible, it's necessary, and I have to admit I'm also baffled as to why the Conservative members are still persisting in their opposition. So even at this late stage, I would urge them to reconsider their position. I don't, maybe Annie, can just nod, Annie Wells could nod along and we'll, we'll take that as a yes. Because if they do care about fairness and improving representation of protected groups, they should be voting for the bill. And summing up, presiding officer, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to reaffirm my support and the support of the Scottish Labour Party for the bill. Creating legislation which gives women greater rights to representation is a bold move and I hope it's the first step towards creating an equal uh, playing field for all women at all levels of public life. As the Cabinet Secretary says, next month will mark 100 years since some women, some women in this country first gained the right to vote. It's a landmark to be celebrated and yet it's still a reminder that despite how far we've travelled in 100 years, the slow march towards true equality of representation for women has still some way to go. So unfortunately, measures like the bill before us today are still required. At the heart of the Gender Representation and Public Boards Bill is the aim of promoting equality in Scotland. And for that reason alone, I am very proud to support it. Thank you very much. And I now call on Alison Harris. I'm very grateful that she is going to give voice to Annie Wells' words. Alison well. Harris. Thank you, Presiding Officer. During the Stage 1 debate, Annie Wells outlined the reasons why she could not support the gender representation on the Public Boards Bill. Annie Wells wants to again stress that whilst we can agree on a vision for gender equality, it will not always be the case that we agree on the means of achieving this. Annie Wells truly appreciates the well-intended nature of the bill, but she cannot be persuaded that it will address the deep-seated societal, economic and cultural barriers that prevent women from applying for such positions in the first place. Following Stage 2 amendments, nor can she be persuaded that the Gender Representation and Public Boards Bill will be effective and a clear piece of legislation. The Scottish Conservatives have worked constructively throughout this bill to ensure that this legislation is the best shape it can be. We have agreed to all Stage 3 amendments as they are minor changes to the schedule of public authorities affected, but based on its basic principles, we will be voting against the bill as a whole. As a member of the Equality and Human Rights Committee, Annie Wells was pleased to see positive changes made at Stage 2 a debate that she was unfortunately unable to attend due to ill health. Annie Wells was pleased to see the addition of Mary Fee's amendment that sought to broaden the definition of women so that any eventual legislation was as inclusive as possible, recognising that not all trans women possess a gender recognition certificate. She was also pleased, having listened to the concerns of the committee, that the Scottish Government committed to issuing guidance to support the operation of the Act. Annie Wells also welcomed Alex Cole Hamilton's amendment, which highlighted the need to address the tiebreaker situation whereby two candidates of equal measure, one a woman and the other a man, with a protected characteristic, may compete for the same position. This was an important addition to the bill, which recognised feedback from their evidence sessions. Despite wishing the bill to be in the best shape it can be, Annie Wells is still of the opinion that remaining ambiguities will prevent it from being a robust piece of legislation. How will it operate in practice is key, and despite her support for the inclusion of other protected characteristics within the bill, Annie Wells remains unconvinced that there can ever be true clarity over the tiebreaker scenario, a significant addition to the bill. She appreciates that guidance will cover this, but as my colleague, or my colleague Jamie Green pointed out at stage two, how will this state clearly to whom greater weight is allocated? 
The Cabinet Secretary stated in response that there will be no automatic preference and that the appointing person could give preference to a man if they consider that to be justified, a phrase that remains as subjective as equal measure. Annie Wells is still also unclear on the effectiveness of the bill that sets legislative targets requiring mandatory reporting, yet do not carry sanctions or penalties for non-compliance. Much was said at the stage one debate about the language and whether or not it was appropriate to use the word quota or statutory quota in relation to how the bill will operate. This is where she finds the bill's objectives confusing. The bill sets out legislative objective that 50% of non-executive public board members are women by the end of 2022, and it goes as far as it can go within the parameters of EU law. If it set out mandatory quotas, this could be construed as positive discrimination and therefore unlawful. The target is aspirational, yes, but at stage two, a Scottish Government amendment strengthened the provisions on reporting so that there will be a statutory duty for public authorities to report on their progress, something that makes the objective more than merely aspirational. On the flip side, no, I'm not, sorry, I'm just reading this on behalf of Annie Wells, Monica, so sorry. On the flip side to this, if this is not a statutory quota and we are merely setting aspirational targets, why, are, why, is, creating the bill, why is creating a specific bill? With no sanctions and penalties in place, does the bill not run the risk of becoming, as she has highlighted before from the committee's report, a bill without appropriate teeth? and one that risks the appearance of legislation for legislation's sake. If we look more broadly at what the bill is trying to achieve, that is gender equality, Annie Wells of course wants to see vast strides being made. Women face similar barriers to getting into public boards as they do private boards and in employment generally, and we should be focusing on the deep-seated issues. Just two of Scotland's 40 listed trading companies, for example, have at least 33% of board positions filled by women, and only one of the 503 executive directors at these businesses are female. The Chartered Institute of Personal and Development explored in a podcast in 2015 whether or not businesses should have mandatory quotas for women in senior positions, listening to the opinions of female business experts. As well as the issue of tokenism with companies being able to create non-executive roles that don't do anything unless uh, useful as to meet statistics, speakers highlighted the need for well thought out organisational designs that enabled women to be brought through the pipeline in ways that break institutional barriers. There are companies that are doing this. As she has said before, such as FDM, and they, these are exemplary models we should push. In the UK-wide survey, Project 2840, looking at the barriers women face in the workplace, improved childcare, flexible and flexible working were cited as central to enabling women's career progression. Legal changes are very well and good, but our cultural expectations about gender run very deep and they need to be addressed in tandem with any legislation. This includes creating transparency around the gender pay gap and making sure that in education, women are getting the best start in life. To conclude today, Annie Wells would like to reiterate her support for achieving equal representation of women in all walks of life, but do not believe statutory quotas are the right means to achieve this. She has questions over how effective they will be in practice. She is concerned that its existence could potentially mask the long-term change that is required to achieve to promote gender equality on both public boards and more widely. While we may go back and forth over semantics and what exactly a statutory quota is, the bill is, in its essence, a legislative target. Instead of getting into creating legislation, which, I, which she believes many still have questions over how it will operate, Annie Well believes it's absolutely essential that we instead focus on tackling the issue of gender inequality more broadly. Positive action doesn't have to be putting through legislation for legislation's sake. We need to be promoting educational reform, improvements in childcare and society's attitude more generally to make real differences to girls growing up in Scotland today. Thank you.
Uh, thank you very much, uh, um, Alison Harrison. The heroic stuff, I mean, to read it, it's actually a good way to avoid being challenged. I must try it myself, get somebody else to read your speech. <laughs> I'll remember that one. I call, <laughs> I'll call Christina McKelvey, we followed by Alexander Stewart. <laughs> Thank you uh, very much, President Officer. As convener of the Equality and Human Rights Committee, we were pleased to have the opportunity to scrutinise the gender representation on public boards bill and seek the views of all of the interested parties. And it's my grateful thanks to the committee members for their contribution and, of course, the many agencies and witnesses who brought evidence written and oral in front of us, uh, to which we have listened to very, very closely. And our grateful thank also goes to the clerks who have put in a heroic effort in the work that they do on the committee. Unfortunately, presiding officer, as we can hear, not everyone has agreed with her determined way ahead, but the majority is clear and the objections are more in form than matter. But I have to say I'm now more confused about the Scottish Conservatives' position. Are they suggesting, suggesting that if there were sanctions and legislation did extend to private boards that they would have supported the bill then? I'm a bit confused about that. Maybe they can address that and sum it up. But, presiding officer, at stage two, a number of amendments were made, as we've heard from members of the committee and the cabinet secretary, addressing the concerns that were raised in the stage one um, investigations, and I'm glad to see them now concluded in the bill. Uh, when the bill was introduced, presiding officer, the latest data showed that women made up 42% of public board membership. Women now make up 45.8% of board membership. And that is serious progress by any measure, but we do need to do more. And we need to have this statutory target that enshrines our commitment to gender equality. And this bill allows us to do that. The very word quota makes some people nervous, obviously people on those benches, but it need not. We are trying to do here what we are trying to do here will work to everyone's advantage yeah. and there are actually no losers. Mm -hmm. Private sector boards are generally, generally responding enthusiastically, mm -hmm. although there are some who continue to try to remain in the past. But if they fight against the prevailing trend, then they themselves will be the ones who will suffer. They may well find them, their clients seeking other suppliers. Their boards will be disadvantaged by the lack of female represented, representation. And as Engender pointed out to us, and I quote, research by Close the Gap found that employers who take concrete steps to address women's inequality in work led to several benefits, including one, a reduction in costs through lower turnover, two, improved employee morale and motivation, and three, higher levels of productivity. There are no losers, presiding officer. And in their paper, Gender Equality Pays, Close the Gap also reports the business benefits of increasing the gender diversity of the workforce lie in better decision making and problem, problem solving capacity as a, vari a variety of perspectives are brought to the table and companies benefiting from the women's market proximity. There are no losers in this bill. Presiding officer, by reflecting the people who serve, gender balance boards can drive excellence and efficiency in public service delivery. That's closed the gap. This will put more pressure upon private companies to be convinced by the public sector lead taken in this bill. And I'm convinced that only a statutory quota will promote a situation where equality becomes the norm, because it's not the norm. What I want to see is the Scottish Government being a leader, seeking to move forward on an issue that sits at the heart of our party's agenda, but hopefully this Parliament's agenda. The 1918 Representation of People's Acts began the process of women being eligible to vote, albeit as long as they were landowners and had their husbands permission, how we have moved on <laughs> since then. But it's only taken 100 years. I'm not prepared to wait yeah. another 100 years. I do sometimes think that there are a terrifying number of people who think that the 1918 Act should still be the case, for, for whom the idea of an independent woman is not only strange, but totally inexplicable, a bit like the Tory position on this bill. Presiding officer, in the evidence, Engender told us that, and I quote, a contributing factor to occupational segregation and men's over-representation in senior positions, including on public boards, are assumptions made about women's and men's capabilities and preferences. However, research from Catalyst, a non-profit organisation working to accelerate the progress for women through workplace inclusion, found that 55% of women aspired to be in a senior leadership position. 
we should create those opportunities for that 55% and more, hopefully. And in gender also added, achieving gender balance on public boards has the potential to influence occupational segregation through challenging gender norms and perceptions around public authority and providing children and young people with a moral, a more diverse range of role models. Equal representation will also drive excellence in public service delivery as decision makers better reflect the populations that they serve. There are no losers in this bill. And finally, presiding officer, Talat Yacoub from the smashing organisation Women 5050, of which I am a steering group member, told us in committee, soft and gentle approaches involving training and development have been done for decades and they have not got us to 50%. I agree with her. And Rory McPherson from the Law Society of Scotland also told the committee, after 10 years of voluntary schemes, we are yet to achieve gender diversity on public boards. Against that background, the Law Society supports the bill. And so do we. Presiding officer, I believe that what the committee has come up with, what the government has come up with, and what working together has, has brought us, has moved us forward. It sets out a clear ambition to genuinely get rid of some of the outdated notions We've heard some today, and to replace them with new traditions built upon equality and fairness. And on that point, presiding officer, I will be supporting the gender representation and public boards bill when it comes to the vote at five o'clock. Thank you. And can I tell members there's time in hand so I can be generous with speeches. You don't hear me saying that very often. Uh, call Alexander Stewart to be followed by Mary Fee. Mr. Stewart, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. No one can fault the intention of this bill. The ambition to make public boards more representative is something that I'm sure we can all support. But the problem, Deputy Presiding Officer, with the bill is that it is unlikely to achieve its objectives. And I do not believe that it will make a meaningful difference to girls and young women who are growing up in Scotland today. It is yet another example of legislation that has not been completely thought through. There is undoubtedly an issue that needs to be addressed because at the moment of the time, women make up 45.8% of membership of public boards, despite accounting for half of the population. The bill for all its faults has at least highlighted the issue and gives it to the attention that the deserves that we should be welcoming and we should be following this as we go forward. But the bill's sole focus on public boards might lead one to mistakenly think that problem is only related to public boards. And this could not be further from the truth. Happy to do so. I'm very grateful. Alec Cole Hamilton. I'm very grateful for the member giving way. I'm struck by his remarks that say that this bill won't achieve anything. Just hot on the heels of Annie Wells's remarks delivered through Alison Harris saying that this is about legislative quotas. Either it won't do anything or it's legislative quotas. It can't be both. Which is it? Mr. Stewart. You're not fixing the underlying problem. Yes, it will take us some journey, but it's not going to take us to where we want to be and where you want to be. So at the moment, as I say, quotas are not the way forward. The situation, in fact, is much worse in the private sector, Deputy Presiding Officer. Recent figures show that just two of Scotland's 40 listed trading companies are hitting the already not very ambitious target of having at least a third of company board positions filled by women. Staggeringly, I'd like to continue. Staggeringly, 13 of these businesses have no women executive directors whatsoever. The fact is that the issue occurs in both the public and private sector. To a worrying degree, it makes it clear that there has to be other fundamental barriers to women getting onto boards other than the unacceptable discrimination with regard to gender. The lack of the ability of more flexible working the lack of affordable and high quality childcare and specific barriers that make it difficult for women to enter some occupations all contribute to the underrepresentation of women on boards. Thank you. Gillian Martin. Very grateful for you to take an intervention from me. Would you agree that one of the issues around the culture uh, with uh, attracting 50-50 on boards is that women can't see themselves in that position. So if you can't see it, you can't be it, which is something that goes way back to when you're actually a, a child looking at, at uh, situations which you can't access. I think, Mr. You know, the, Stewart. The, the, world, the world is full of leading women and there are leading women in all sectors. Uh, the ambition of women is very much there. Uh, and I think that 
by creating that, and we have created that to give them the opportunity to move forward and giving them this. But as I've said before, creating a quota is not the right way forward. This is not the way for some businesses that are trying to tackle the issue. But they are attempting to break down some of these barriers, Deputy Presiding Officer, and that has been focused by many organisations and many individuals. Those businesses are taking this positive step to recognise that there is a discrimination and there is a clear opportunity to work within the workforce. There is nevertheless still the issue that needs to be addressed to make public boards more representative, but the bill is very confused at how it's going to achieve the same. It mixes a variety of different approaches to see that, that it's, it's, con, it's, it's somewhat uh, contrasting what it's trying to achieve. Will the bill set the voluntary target at 50% of non-executive board members should the women by, that, by, by 2022? It also includes a mandatory quota place, the duties on the public authorities in an effect to achieve its objectives. The requirement of public authorities to report on the actions they have taken to meet the target will not be enough. This effectively no sanction or on compulsory, so that that is poor and that's difficult to enforce. What is the point if we've got difficulty to enforce? No, I'd like to make some progress. Thank you. Even if we uh, assume that duties on public bodies uh, will not be enforceable, the situation if we have two candidates are exactly the same qualified for the role is likely to be far from between. It is therefore still unclear as to whether the, the tiebreaker measure will make up and it will make a real meaningful difference with the promotion on public boards. This is a more fundamental issue, which is the bill, however, that it is the fact that it does not even set out public boards fully represented in Scotland as a whole. Women are, of course, not the only groups underrepresented on public boards. It is essential that we look at the dis disability. 19% of the population fall into that category, but only 7.9% of the members sit on boards. Moreover, the, uh, those ethnic minorities make up 4% of the population. That's not the case. And young people also do not have the opportunity. This bill does nothing to address these discrimination of these individuals and the property to ensure that it's going forward. And that was something that was highlighted during uh, the consultation of the bill, Deputy Presiding Officer. So in conclusion, I am happy to support the amendments to the bill because it brings forward today in effect to improve the equality of legislation. But like my colleagues, I cannot support the bill in its entirety. All of us want to see equality, representation of women in public boards and in employment generally, but it is not and it will not go forward on statutory quotas and that is not the right way to achieve the aims and objectives. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you, Mr Stewart. I call Mary Fee to be followed by Julian Martin. Ms Fee, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I'm pleased to speak in this debate today. And as my colleague Monica Lennon said in her opening remarks, the Scottish Labour Party fully supports the Gender Representation on Public Boards Scotland Bill. And during the Stage 1 debate, it was recognised by members from across the Chamber that there was a need to amend this bill, and I'm glad this need for change was recognised at Stage 2. At stage one, I highlighted the need for the bill to be amended to contain a definition of a woman to include a person with the protected characteristic of gender reassignment who is living as a female. And I'd like to take this opportunity today to thank the Cabinet Secretary and the Scottish Government officials for their willingness to engage constructively at stage two with the Equality and Human Rights Committee in order to amend and improve this legislation. And I'm particularly grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for supporting the amendment to ensure that the bill is inclusive of all women, including trans women who do not possess a gender recognition certificate. And I'd also like to take this opportunity, Deputy Presiding Officer, to thank the Equality Network, Stonewall and the Scottish Trans Alliance for bringing this issue to my attention. The vital importance of assuring, ensuring the bill is inclusive of trans women is highlighted by Stonewall's new research, mm -hmm. published last week, which highlighted that over half of trans people have hidden their identity at work for fear of discrimination. And in addition, I'd like to thank my colleagues of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee for the important role they have played in scrutinising and strengthening this bill at stage th two through th their amendments. And presiding officer, the importance of this bill cannot be understated. It is one important step towards achieving gender parity. This bill will act as a comprehensive, effective and robust lever 
to promote gender parity on public boards in Scotland. Voluntary measures to promote gender parity on public boards have closed the gap somewhat. However, this legislation introduces a duty to ensure that by 2020, women will make up 50% of non-executive board members. In the centenary year of the extension of the franchise to some women, and I, I, I would repeat that it is only some women who were given the vote, those over 30 years old, this piece of legislation highlights that despite the gradual and hard fought improvements over the last 100 years, women in Scotland still have to fight for equal representation. This legislation is not simply about having token women in the room or around the meeting table. This is about real and tangible equal representation. And further, it is about equal representation to decision-making authority and power. The fight for gender equality endures. In Scotland today, men continue to hold the power in decision-making and men continue to dominate public life. Men continue to be a majority in our boardrooms, in our parliaments, and on our public boards. This legislation will empower women by promoting the redistribution of decision-making authority on our public boards through 50-50 gender representation. And I welcome the Scottish Government's amendment to the bill at stage two, which requires Scottish ministers to report on the operation of the Act to the Scottish Parliament. This level of parliamentary scrutiny is essential given the role that's played by government ministers in making appointments to public boards. And the ability of parliament to question government, government ministers is good for this bill, good for this parliament and good for democracy as it promotes greater accountability and transparency in decision making. And presiding officer, in coming to a close, I would once again like to reiterate my support of the Gender Representation on Public Boards Scotland Bill, which will ensure gender parity on public boards by 2020. We must remember the importance of representative public boards, because when women are seen to succeed, more women engage and participate in the, the public sphere. I believe the promotion of 50-50 gender representation on public boards in Scotland can signal a symbolic shift in all areas of society to empower more, wen, more women, sorry, that was a slip of the tongue, presiding officer, <laughs> more women, definitely more women, to become engaged in public life in Scotland and to hold positions which have decision-making authority. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Gillian Martin to be followed by Alison Johnson. Ms Martin, please. Thank you, presiding officer. Um, I'm not just happy to be speaking on this bill, I'm absolutely delighted and proud. Um, it's hugely important in its context and I think it has implications beyond the actual legislation. And the bill should have a number of positive knock-on effects which go beyond its remit, which I think are equally important and underpin its importance. I will draw on the work done in the Economy Committee, the Gender Pay Gap, um, which concluded last year, and the ongoing work being done in the cross-party group on women and enterprise, which I convene. In a wider sense, targets are absolutely essential in encouraging gender represent representation, and they have been shown to work. Um, one piece of evidence that we heard in the gender pay gap sessions touched on this issue. Professor Ian Wall spoke about efforts to increase gender diversity in STEM research and higher education, and he was saying that the uptake of the programme was slow uh, from women until funders began to make gender diversity a prerequisite to achieving certain types of funding. It meant that they actually um, went out to actually attract women in and made the moves in place to allow women to actually access uh, this research. Um, Professor Wall said a phrase that I'll, I'll always remember, encouragement is good, but compuls compulsion works too. Ultimately, within this constraints of the government, this government's powers, we must deal in both encouragement and compulsion. They can work in tandem, they have to work in tandem. It's why I disagree with some of what Annie Wells' speech suggests, that it was either or. Um, we're able to legislate, but we, that legislation might actually uh, inform a change in culture. It might actually uh, encourage a change in culture. 
Um, the oft-quoted Kinsey report on the gender pay gap shows that diverse boards lead to better business performance in the private sector too. But uh, Tanya, Tanya Castell from Changing the Chemistry gave evidence to her committee, um, which went deeper than that. And she noticed that not only is the gender representation on boards that matters, but it's an organisation's wider culture. Um, an organisation with a more diverse board may perform better, but this may be a result of an inclusive culture throughout an organisation rather than just at its highest levels. Um, but the move today is hugely important because what, what it does is it allows that conversation around gender representation on all boards across public and private sector to take place. So the and bill can be seen as one part of a wider initiative and programme being undertaken by the Scottish Government. Um, the other initiative being the, uh, that's relevant to this, the Scottish Business Pledge, which includes nine ways for Scottish businesses uh, to be more fair and progressive. Um, one of these is about deve uh, de developing a balanced workforce um, by having gender parity on boards but also having a, a commitment to eradicating the gender pay gap, which of course isn't just about equal play, it's about giving women opportunities for promotion that the, their male counterparts get as well. Um, the phrase, I, just, I want to say before I go on, that the phrase token women really upsets me because it suggests that there are no women with talent enough to be put into board level. And I, I would just like to sort of like pay tribute to the overlooked women of generations who had that talent who would never ever have thought themselves a token woman, but were never ever um, fortunate enough to actually get a seat in the boardroom. So this parliament across most of its benches recognises um, better and more equal gender representation is an economic issue. But I would like to add and emphasise that women's representation is also an intersectional issue and is recognised by the business pledge. To develop diverse businesses and reap the benefits of diversity, we must consider women's representations at all levels of work all ages and coming from all backgrounds because we do better business, we make better products, we give better services and we uh, can realise our potential as a company, uh, as a country rather, and companies and organisations ultimately make better decisions. Um, one way increasing rep women's representation on public boards will help us achieve this cultural change is through the development of a new generation of women mentors. In my work as the convener of the cross-party group Women in Enterprise, this is a regular thing that comes up in topics of, of conversation. Um, research conducted last year by Women's Enterprise Scotland showed that 43% of women who own businesses identified mentoring as the main support needed to grow their business. So by bringing more women with experience into public boards into Scotland, that means that we're going to have a, a bigger culture that can encourage women to, get, to take their place in private sector boards as well. Um, and this is a significant opportunity that this bill engenders. Um, I welcome this bill, both for its effects on public boards in Scotland, which I think are significant, but for the, mainly for the message that it sends across the country and beyond. And I hope that this message will be one uh, important part of changing our general culture of work and achie achieving gender equity across Scotland in both the public and private sector. And I'm not just supportive of this bill, I will be voting at decision time with huge pride at what has been put before us. Thank you. I call Alison Johnson to be followed by Gail Ross. Ms Johnson, please. Um, thank you, presiding officer. I'd like to apologise for missing the beginning of the debate due to a misunderstanding on my part. And I regret missing the Cabinet Secretary's opening because I appreciate that she has a deep personal commitment to this issue, um, for which I'm very grateful. I'm really glad to have the opportunity to confirm the Scottish Green Party's support for the bill, and I thank the committee for the work it has led to bring the bill to this stage, to the clerks, to Spice, and to all who've given evidence and stakeholders who've worked to improve the bill. As a co-founder of Women 5050, campaigning for at least 50% representation of women in our parliament, in our councils and on public boards, I believe that passing this bill brings us an important step closer towards that today. And I'd like to take an opportunity to thank Talat Yacoub and all my colleagues in that excellent group as we continue to work together. We know that targets and quotas are successful. The international evidence highlighted by Engender and others is clear that targets and quotas can be used to great effect to bring about change. And this is really important. In November, in this parliament, I hosted 
an event which focused on the disproportionate impact austerity has and is having on women. Austerity is gendered. We heard from organisations that night, from Engender, from Scottish Women's Aid, from One Parent Family Scotland, from academic experts like Dr Morag Trainer, from the Women's Budget Group, from Glasgow's University Social Support and Migration in Scotland's research team. We heard about the impact cuts were having on women. Imagine 70 to 85% of cuts to, to public spending on benefits, taxation, pay and pensions have impacted on women. I can't dissociate that from the way that our national life is managed. Thank you. Christina McKelvey. Thank you very much, President Nelson, and thank you so much for taking intervention. Would, would the member also agree with me that a two-child family cap in a rape clause is yep. also a serious barrier to women's progression in Scotland today? Alison Johnson. Absolutely. It is wholly discriminatory, absolutely appalling. Um, and I know that that is the majority view of this chamber. We've heard that women have burn, burn, borne the, bul the brunt of welfare reform. And changes to vital social and economic support are typically not planned with women in mind, with their needs, with their interests. Women still carry out the majority of hidden domestic caring, of emotional labour, if you like. Work, work that's hard to quantify in any economic analysis, but it's hugely valuable. And when women aren't adequately represented on public boards, it minimises opportunities to create more gender sensitive public services. It's a declaration of our indifference to that wider lack of representation. As a councillor in Edinburgh, when schools and nurseries were being closed, I've said this before and I will say it again, my surgeries, the meetings were full of women. When it came to taking the votes, where were they? You know, largely absent because they're not represented in the numbers they should be in all of these chambers. So this bill is a really important step, but it should be acknowledged as a starting point for further action to improve diversity on public boards and in public life more generally. Now, Patrick Harvey raised in the bill stage one debate that as a party, the Greens know that intentions alone don't result in gender balance. You know, we have gender balance candidate selection mechanisms in place. We make sure that we've got gender balance at the top of our regional lists. Um, as well as throughout them, but I am in Parliament with, with five male colleagues, so there is more to be done. And where I will agree with the Conservatives is this is not all about legislation. Cultural change and support in the background is essential too, because if you're a candidate at the top of the list and you're a, a single parent, 92% of whom happen to be women, with caring responsibilities, how can you possibly go out and canvass and campaign if you don't have adequate childcare support, for example? So we have to look at this issue in the round, but I'm absolutely determined that this is a very positive and important step. Globally, almost 77% of parliamentarians are men. Are we actually suggesting that they're all there purely on merit? <laughs> and you know, we never... <laughs> Gillian, Gillian Martin rightly pointed out that, that we refer to token women. Has anyone ever referred to token men on a quota? <laughs> Um, so, yeah, currently we've got a limited set of statistics showing changes in the demographic profile of some board members, but they don't give us great insight into how gender intersects with other protected characteristics. So we've got to acknowledge that many people face multiple barriers to making their voices heard and to taking up leader positions, lead public leadership positions. And from available statistics, we know that the percentage of disabled people on boards has reduced 15.3% in 2013-14 to 7.9% last year. And even that higher figure of 15.3% isn't representative. Disabled people make up nearly 20% of Scotland's population. As in gender stress, it's extremely important that the full diversity of women be represented in public office. So strategies to enable women from minority ethnic, minority faiths, refugee communities, sexualities, we have to make sure that we are truly representative, that we're striving towards that representation in public life because it will bring significant benefits. As bodies develop and strengthen their strategies to encourage women to become members of a public board, it's crucial that those strategies consider that intersectional approach and I very warmly welcome Mary Fee's comments. Um, presiding officer, in closing, um, I, I, I think the conservative approach, if I'm understanding it, is just wait just wait until 
you, you know, this parliament is properly gender representative. At the rate we're going, that will take 50 years. Um, that is too slow for me, and I really warmly welcome the progress we're making today. Thank you. Thank you. I call Gail Ross, to be followed by Alec Cole Hamilton. Ms. Ross, please. Thank you, President Officer. As a member of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee, I would also like to begin by once again thanking everyone that gave evidence to our committee, both in writing and in person, the clerks and Spice, and also to my fellow committee members. And like Gillian Martin, I would like to say that I'm delighted to be able to speak in this important debate at stage three of the Gender Representation on Public Board Scotland Bill. The bill introduces the Gender Representation Objective, which aims for 50% of non-executive members on public boards in Scotland being women. Now, to me, this is a step forward for common sense. Women represent 52% of the population, but we still find ourselves vastly underrepresented at every step of the decision-making process mm -hmm. in both public organisations and private companies. If we take politics as an example, we make up 29% of local council, we're only 17% of members of the European Parliament, and only 35% of members of this Parliament are currently female. Now, addressing the underrepresentation of women on boards is a key priority of the Scottish Government, and I thought it would be a key priority of the Scottish Parliament as well. Absolutely. But unfortunately, we are not agreed on this, either as a committee or here in the Chamber. The Scottish Government has been working to improve gender balance in public life for a number of years. Our Cabinet has a 50-50 gender balance and our own manifesto committed to continuing support in the work of Women 50-50 and in her opening remarks the Cabinet Secretary also laid out many other initiatives that we support. Mm -hmm. We need to support people that have a contribution to make to public life whether they are male or female. We have to use encouragement and education and confidence building and everything else at our disposal to achieve a gender balance but we now need to go further. And as the convener of our committee, Christina McKelvey, has already said, Talati Kub from Women 5050 told us, soft and gentle approaches involving training and development have been done for decades, and they have still not got us to 50%. Public boards will have to provide evidence in a reporting system to show how they have altered their criteria for membership to reflect the skills and attributes that women have to offer. Now, there have been concerns raised that having perceived quotas runs the risk of putting a candidate in a position for the sake of satisfying a target. But I reject those because the merit is undeniably there. We must take action to remedy the factors that impede women from reaching the positions they undoubtedly have the knowledge, qualifications and experience to hold. Now, this bill does nothing to change the fact that appointments will still be made on merit and that the best person for the job will be selected. But the stipulation of targets such as this one leaves less room for the things which have precluded women in the past, such as the harmful role of gender stereotyping, the prevalence of unconscious and unquestioned bias, and the fact that many women lack confidence in their own abilities. This obstacle also coincides with other issues which discourage women from these roles, such as care and responsibilities, the gender pay gap, and the sexual harassment crisis that we're currently facing in all walks of life. Mm -hmm. And although welcome advances have been made to achieving gender equality, we're not there yet, and we hope that this bill, when passed, will get us closer to reaching this aim. And this matters, because data shows that fairness in gender balance leads to better, fairer decisions and better outcomes for organisations and public service delivery. And I truly believe that this bill is significant, not just for the positive impact it will have in terms of practical decision making, but also for its symbolic value in promoting gender equality. And yes, gender balance does need to be fixed in many other walks of life. And no one's saying that this is a panacea, but it is a start. Now the Conservatives say that the bill is no use without sanctions. But there's no explanation of what those sanctions would be. These are public boards responsible for millions of pounds of public money. Would you have us find them? Mm -hmm. On one hand, they advocate for voluntary measures. But on the other hand, they want to impose sanctions. Which is it? And I'll please do. Jamie Green. I think just to clarify, as a few members have raised this, uh, we're not purporting that there should be sanctions on public boards. What we're asking is, 
if there are no sanctions, then what is the point of the bill? If it, has, if it has no enforcement whatsoever in its ability to enforce the objectives of the bill on the public bodies that it purports to uh, impose on. That is simply a question that we're asking. Gail Ross. I think I, I'm, I'm really actually quite confused about that intervention. If there's no sanctions on public boards, how can we re realise the objectives of the bill? But my question was, what sanctions would you want to see on a public board? How, how would you sanction them? What we want to see is a reporting mechanism that shows how they have gone about encouraging these women to apply for the positions that are currently dominated by men. So, and I also hope, President Officer, that by shining a light on the public sector, which we hope to do here, we can also encourage better gender equality in the private sector as well. Now, in my speech on uh, stage one, I gave several pieces of evidence that we had taken in the committee, and I'm not going to go over them all again, strong as they are, but I will leave you with this one quote from Suzanne Conlin from the Scottish Women's Convention, who said, one of the reasons we think this bill is important is because women tell us it is. And a great deal of thought and scrutiny has gone in from the chamber and from the committee into this bill. And we think that it's currently the best mechanism for promoting gender equality in public boards that we can provide. I'm glad to see that the amendments at stage three were passed. And again, like Gillian Martin and everyone else on this side of the chamber, I will be supporting the final bill today. I will be very proud to do so. And I will urge other in the, others in the chamber to do likewise. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Alec Cole Hamilton, followed by David Torrance. Mr. Cole Hamilton, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I start by adding my thanks to the clerks, to Spice, to all the witnesses who helped our committee get this bill before us in this form this afternoon. This is a bit of a first for me. It's the first time I've spoken in the stage three proceedings of a bill that I've helped to steward through every part of the parliamentary process. And if I may say so, that experience sets a standard against which I will measure every other bill that I'm involved in throughout my parliamentary career. Given the hugely important nature of this bill and the cultural change that it seeks to foster, it was very gratifying that in the main, the members of Equalities and Human Rights Committee, of which I'm vice convener, were able to set aside our party differences and come together to make this bill as good as it possibly can be. I'm very grateful to the Cabinet Secretary and her advisers and bill team uh, for the, the access and fair consideration they gave me in respect of the changes that I sought to bring about at stage two, particularly around the inclusion of references to protected characteristics, which members have been very kind to recognise this afternoon. Now, in, early, uh, in earlier iterations of the bill, clause four in section four um, left the means by which you could disregard the imperative to appoint a woman in the event of a tie open to interpretation. It suggested that appointing person could choose to select a man over a woman in the event of a tie if there was a characteristic particular to that man other than merit which commended his appointment. To my mind and to that of many stakeholders, the subjective interpretation of this clause offered a loophole which could undermine the spirit of this bill in its entirety. I appointed him because we've been friends for years and he deserves this could theoretically have been the characteristic cited as a reason to disregard the gender representation objective. So my amendment to give explicit reference, reference to protected characteristic in section four addresses this. It also answers the concerns of other minority groups um, who throughout our, our consideration um, of evidence gave light to their significant concerns. They feared that leaving this bill unamended would actually threaten efforts to increase diversity in other ways. They argued that with a sole focus on appointing a female candidate in the event of a tie, we might close off an opportunity to appoint someone uh, with a disability or from an ethnic minority background. The wording arrived at in collaboration with the government answers both of these issues and I'm grateful again for their fair hearing afforded to me. Now on the uh, issue of sanctions, I, I've been listening with interest to the Conservative line of attack on this. Um, the reporting duties and the reporting duty amendments I helped to, to draft actually create an imperative 
for uh, organisations to consider how they deliver on their duties to that act. It's a, a tried and tested technique, but I also need to point to um, the, the Conservative Party, often self-styled as the guardians of the public purse, that if we were to sanction public bodies, we would actually be penalising financially public organisations as well. So I, I don't see any sense to that. I'd also like to take this moment to acknowledge the efforts of my colleague Mary Fee for her work, as others have mentioned, to amend the bill to establish a definition for women and by so doing recognise trans women um, in the context of this legislation. It's fair to say that this bill has been stewarded through our committee with the spirit of consensus shared across all benches. That was until the Conservative members came ashen-faced to our meeting before the stage one debate to reveal that after all their efforts to help scrutinise and improve the bill, their party would not, after all, be supporting it. Now, the principal controversy around this bill for the Tory party, as we've heard, has been the view that this will lead to some kind of affirmative action, where the creation of a gender representation quota somehow um, objective somehow equates the imposition of a quota. Their suggestion is that once enacted, this legislation will impede a male applicant of higher calibre than a woman. Nonsense. By any stretch of the imagination, this bill has nothing to do with quotas. Indeed, the section which covers this, the very heart of the bill, could not be clearer. It states, the appointing person must determine whether any particular candidate is best qualified for the appointment. And then, if no particular candidate is best qualified for the appointment, the appointing person must identify candidates it considers equally qualified. It goes on to make provision for the appointing officer to select a woman in the event of the tie if that board was not achieved the gender representation objective. In that first clause, the, if that first clause, the merit clause, does not, did not exist, then this would not be acceptable, nor would it be legal. Indeed, the phrase best qualified for the appointment trumps everything and holds below the waterline any assertion that boards would be compelled to put a 50-50 target ahead of talent. So I'm baffled by the position taken by the Conservatives here. No other interpretation of this bill can take you away from the reality that merit has supremacy over gender in the clauses that we debate today. I'm about to ask you to come in, actually. Just hold on two seconds. Jamie, you can answer. Indeed, last September, during our consideration of the bill in committee, Annie Wells herself stated as much when she said, to my mind, this bill has merit at its heart. So I'd be, I indeed would welcome an intervention from Jamie to speak on behalf of Ms. Wells on this point. As I asked her at stage one, I certainly agreed with Annie Wells, uh, what she said about this in September. So why doesn't she? I think that's an invitation extended to Mr. Green, which I think you've accepted. An invitation to intervene. Uh, I, I can't comment on behalf of Annie Wells. Uh, I will try and elicit from her uh, before my closing remarks uh, that specific point. But I guess I, I do want to ask a question to Mr. Cole Hamilton around the definition of best qualified and equally qualified. They do, uh, on the face of it, seem very subjective terms. And I do wonder how an appointing person will address those very issues in the event of the so-called tie break when preference in that situation will be given to a woman candidate. I do have concerns that those are very unclear and unspecified, undefined terms. Well, I thank uh, Alec Cole Hamilton. I thank Jamie Green for that slightly long intervention. Um, I'm not sure how we you have go, time in hand. Thank you, thank you, Deputy <laughs> Presiding Officer. I'm not sure how you go about appointing people within the Conservative Party. I hope there is some system to it. But usually, when you're involved in an appointment process, you score people against the person's specification. You give them a ranking. Sometimes it's very sophisticated, with hundreds of points awarded, and then surely you can ca calibrate that against two equally qualified. Uh, people, you'll identify them by their scoring. I, I certainly hope that you take that seriously when you appoint people within your party. Um, so, I find both Annie Wells' conversion against this bill and that of Jamie Green, presumably at the hands of their whip, singularly depressing. Presiding officer, this legislation may represent just a light touch on the tiller in terms of the actual impact it will have in the makeup of public boards right now, uh, which, we, as we've already heard, gratifyingly, we are making significant process to parity towards, but it is absolutely vital. It is as necessary as it is welcome. It builds in a mindset that will ensure our struggle towards parity in gender representation in the engine rooms of our society is both continuous and is lasting. Next week, we will celebrate the centenary of women's suffrage. 100 years on, we still see 
every aspect of our life, the frontiers that we must still contend with if we are to bring full gender equality, whether that's in the struggle around equal pay, in sexual harassment, in gender stereotypes. I am proud to have played just a small part in this chamber's efforts to push back on at least one of these frontiers in the bill that we debate this afternoon, and I urge the chamber to support it. Thank you. Thank you. I call David Torrance, to be followed by Rachel Hamilton. Mr Torrance, please. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome this opportunity to speak in this today's debate on the Gender Representation on Public Boards Scotland Bill in order to raise the importance of the issue of gender equality and make equal representation a statutory duty. Throughout history, government institutions have suffered from unequal gender representation and continue to be to this day in most advanced democracies. Less than 20% of women on average are represented in national parliaments globally and the percentage is significantly smaller at lower levels of government. Despite the general picture, there are some exceptions, such as Rwanda, Sweden and South Africa, key countries where we are lagging behind significantly. Essentially, one half of the world's population is underrepresented. This is unacceptable. Throughout history, governments have achieved little in actively promoting diversity, supporting the minority ethnic faith and refugee communities, women from working class backgrounds, disabled women, younger and older women, and lesbian, and bisexual and transgender women. I'm proud that this Parliament and Government have made unprecedented, unprecedented progress. If we are to progress as a democracy, the 52% of female Scottish population should be given equal representation in our elected bodies, public boards, as well as our private sphere. Recent research highlights some key facts that support this bill. Globally, women generate 37% of the world GDP, whilst making up 50% of the global working age population. They are underrepresented in all areas of the economy, highlighting the underlying gender imbalance both for our society as well as our global and national economies. The facts are well known. Evidence from all over the world has shown that forms of diversity are central to a productive workforce, which has knock-on effects for our population. It leads to a better democratic practices by addressing the debate about who governs. Research has shown that the gender gap in this country councils have shrunk. Female representation in Scottish councils increased from 24 to 29 per cent since 2012. However, women continue to be represented less and one in three councillors as of the May elections in 2016. At present, 76 per cent of local councillors in Scotland are men. Equal gender representation leads to vibrant cultures, greater innovation and creativity. In order to do this, we need to change our government representative system that discourages rather than applauds this key initiative. One of the main shifts we have seen in equal representation of genders has been attributed to the adapt adaptation of positive measures, which is a measurement of aims to improve women's rep representation and participation. Benefits of this bill mirror benefits of results achieved by these actions. It is proven to create diversity in elected women in office, bring women's issues to the heart of policy making, change the gender nature of the public and private spheres, and set examples for those interested in politics. As a member of the Qualities and Human Rights Committee, since the beginning of the session, we have heard hours of evidence. The evidence our, our committee took from it engendered suggests that a gender power balance in the wider public domain has a major impact on the quality of outcomes across government. We found that women have stopped putting themselves forward for positions on public boards following multiple unsuccessful attempts to secure interviews for positions for which they were clearly qualified for. And it is believed that this is due to gender discrimination. Increasing the number of women in positions of power, including the public boards, is one step forward to combat this. This must be accompanied by supporting measures, by encouraging equal representation of genders in public bodies. We challenge the normative gender roles, <coughs> stereotypes and perception around the public authority. Positive measures have proved successful in several countries from around the globe. Uganda is a country that stands with a out with 35% representation rate rising from 3% before the implementation of quotas. South Af Africa adopted voluntary gender quotas, and while optional, the South African National Assembly rose from 4% to 25%. Similarly, Bolivia's legal candidate quotas symbolizes a step forward in equal gender representation, by requiring political parties to nominate an equal number of women and men as candidates in elections. The, the trends are similar in advanced de democracies, especially in regards to public bodies. International evidence has demonstrated that adds to the different perspectives of policy making and increases the prospect of public gender sensitive services. 
The Nordic model, for example, apply equal gender representation laws in all public commissions, committees and boards. The knock-on effect means that the public sector is encouraged to change organisational cultures in order to increase the demand for women on boards and chairs. Roll up political parties pay is crucial in levelling the playing field if we are to adopt this bill. Legally binding measures is a must in order to break down obstacles of women's participation. While you are making steady progress, the pace of change remains slow. Over the past few months, the committee has carefully drafted a report that makes several recommendations in order to improve details of the bill being discussed today. These include that the law is understood and accessible, adequate in monitoring of progress, as well as ensuring that the bill is applicable to trans women. The bill is designed to help tackle a variety of economic, culture, social and political factors that discourage women from applying to certain positions. We need to ensure that the laws are being properly implemented so that the aims are achieved. The Scottish Government are committed to enforce and it will hold public officials to account. We must compensate for institutional and cultural obstacles as a result of gender imbalance to access systemic discrimination. In conclusion, President Officer, I welcome the support of the Chamber today for a vital piece of legislation. It is our job as policymakers to promote justice and women's interests in public life and to ensure that incremental yet positive changes. We must continue to work with our organisations who play a direct or indirect role in enforcing gender equality laws, including women's organisations, grassroots institutions, courts and individuals in our daily lives. This bill will lead to unprecedented opportunities to have uncovering barriers to social and economic resources, training opportunities, quality employment and career progress. President Officer, at five o'clock today, I will fully support this bill. I call Rachel Hamilton to be followed by Jenny Gilruth. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to speak into today's debate. The Scottish Conservatives agree that we should see more women on public boards, but this bill is not the way to do it. The bill has ambiguity, ambiguity, I can't say it. Thank you. As my colleagues have highlighted, can there ever be true clarity over the tiebreaker scenario? Alex Cole Hamilton has just given us his subjective view on the process of point scoring applicants to overcome the tie break situation, which isn't exactly a solution. No doubt there should be a drive to see equal representation on public boards. Scotland is getting there, as we've heard today, with 45.8% women. Day by day, month by year, year by year, we are seeing improvements made, albeit slowly, and we must and we must and we should see these improvements. Deputy Presiding Officer, this legislation may risk covering problems within society. It may create a false impression that everything is fine when in reality it is not. I hope as we all do to see 50-50 representation on public boards and so in other walks of life too. This legislation, however, may make it harder to identify not just the root causes of gender discrimination because we no longer have an outcome to measure progress against and the focus must be on the root cause and I too pay tribute to the fine and able women who have fallen through that net. I'll give way to Monica Lennon. Monica Lennon. I'm grateful to Rachel Hamilton for taking the intervention. We've heard a lot today from the Conservative benches about some of the technical concerns that you have with the bill but it hasn't escaped my notice that when you look at the Women 5050 website which states it's a principal objectives, and you look at the MSPs who have signed up to that, there isn't a single Scottish Conservative MSP who backs the principles of 50% representation, not only on public boards, but in the Parliament and in our councils. Why is that, Rachel Hamilton? Uh, uh, Rachel Hamilton, I can allow you, you some extra time. Thank you, for that intervention. Uh, you will know that I um, am part of a Women to Win organisation within the uh, Scottish Conservative Party, which Annie Wells, my colleague, and I are instrumental. And we seek to, in political sphere, um, increase the gender balance within our own party through, um, through, through that initiative. So... I ask, how do we eliminate male attitudes of weak gender, gender stereotyping towards women? Indeed, many causes start mm. at the grassroots and not on boards. It is in those environments where prejudices are formed and gender stereotyping is perpetuated. It is those stereotypes and prejudices that we must mm. challenge daily. And indeed, as politicians and as a society, we must question our actions. To make that progress, we need to continue to challenge unacceptable attitudes. And that is happening. 
The end of last year and the beginning of this year has highlighted that. The Me Too movement has uncovered sexist and misogynist behaviours in Hollywood. Last year, those same behaviours were exposed mm. in Parliament and this year exposed in the business community. There is no longer a place to hide for such attitudes and behaviours, and there should not be. Our own Parliament has just carried out a survey and will take action shortly to make sure these attitudes are stamped out. This legislation will also not address what we see in the private sector, despite the positive progress in public boards. The situation has worsened. Just two of Scotland's 40 listed trading companies have hit the target of having at least 33% of board positions filled by women. And only five of the 103 executive directors at these businesses are female, down from eight last year. I'll take an intervention. Was it Christina? Christina McKelvey. Yeah. Thanks very much, President Officer. Thank you very much to Rachel Hamilton for taking this intervention. Is Rachel Hamilton then saying that the Tory position is that this bill should be extended to private boards? Because that is the only way we are going to deal with this instead of dancing round the daffodils and being here in 50 years' time saying the same things. Rachel Hamilton. Well, may I ask Christina McKelvey mm. why she believes, um, or does, it, does she believe that it's unacceptable that Scottish ministers recently appointed just one woman member out of a board of seven on the Crown Estate Scotland. Was that because it was an interim measure or was that just because they're not dealing with their own ingrained attitudes? Mm. <coughs> there, it, this is... Mm. Uh, can, I, can, you just, can I just make some progress, please, Gail Ross? This is evidence that there is still something very wrong at grassroots level. Do these organisations mm. provide an environment that promotes equal opportunities, offer flexible working hours and support women returning to work? Deputy Presiding Officer, more work needs to be done to explore solutions to barriers for entry for women into the workplace. For women are still underrepresented in our workforce and this can be because of lack of flexible working hours, lack of affordable and quality childcare and occupational segregation, plus a lack of opportunities for men and women to network. These issues are the same that prevent women from appearing on public boards. These issues should be focused on. An innovative and dynamic approach to work culture needs to be evaluated and addressed. Move towards an approach that works for everyone, private and public boards. And with developments in technology, a solution that works for everyone should be easy to find. This legislation may be supported, but I fear it would not do anything to tackle the issues that have resulted in a gender representation imbalance. The contrast mm. between public and private highlights a huge issue in respect to approach. We must therefore expl explore reasons for that difference further and understand where it is going wrong. For when we uncover the causes, we can work towards a solution to both. My colleague Annie Wells highlighted another issue mm. with the legislation as it currently stands in that this might create issues of positive discrimination and evidence gathered has highlighted that some feel that mandatory quotas are discriminatory. If the bill sets out mandatory quotas, this could be construed as positive discrimination, which is unlawful. It is this ambiguity, ambiguity, <laughs> thank you, that this bill has the potential to create. Legislation should not be passed while these issues are still prevalent and questions are being asked whether the bill will do harm. To close, Deputy Presiding Officer, the Scottish Conservatives cannot support this legislation because we understand this is not the right way to see 50-50 representation. That does not mean that we do not want to see gender balance. Of course we do, and of course we must work towards that goal. To do that, we need to focus on root causes and not on this ambiguous bill. Hey. Jenny Gorruth, followed by Kezia Dugdale. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and can I also thank the members of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee for all their work on the bill. Um, it's a privilege to have the opportunity to speak in today's debate, particularly in a week in which we will see two pieces of landmark legislation change the lives of women in Scotland for the better. Um, and as the Cabinet Secretary described it, a moment that the Parliament can be proud of. Out with the Scottish National Party, uh, there is a, an assumption that to sit on these benches requires an initiation ceremony consisting of a brave heart marathon, chasing a haggis whilst clad in a kilt and bellowing freedom into the abyss. But for me as a 21 year old with no political party preference, it was the issue of women's representation which has consistently informed my political beliefs. 
That inequality which underpins a Scottish Parliament in which 65% of all MSPs are male. That unfairness which allowed for an all-male corporate body to exist. And that sexism which continues to this day in this place where the average salary of a female member of staff in Holyrood is 11% lower than that of her male counterpart. Equal opportunity was, of course, built into the re-establishment of Holyrood as one of the founding principles. And I suppose I really should declare an interest here as a token woman uh, on the SNP benches, as opponents of this bill have argued. Because I was elected alongside some extremely talented colleagues, including Gail Ross MSP and Gillian Martin, in 2016 following my party's decision to take action to tackle the underrepresentation of women in the SNP. Because this issue has been contentious for my party historically. So on this issue, therefore, the Labour Party must be given due credit. Because it was the Labour Party in 1999 who twinned their candidates. And because of that, Holyrood has always been regarded as more equal in terms of our political representation of women. Now, in 2005, the SNP did not have a great track record when it came to female representation. Out of our 27 MSPs in Holyrood, only nine were women. Across Holyrood, however, female representation stood at 39%. But this was only because of Labour's use of positive discrimination and indeed 56% of Labour's MSPs were women during session two. In Westminster, however, the picture was markedly worse. Following the 2005 general election, only one in five of all MPs were women. In early 2006, the annual sex and power report found it could take another 200 years for women to reach political equality in UK politics. So here we are in 2018, 100 years on from when most women were first bequeathed the power to vote, less than a year after Muirfield Golf Club finally decided that perhaps it was time to allow women to join. After, of course, only losing the right to hold the Open Golf Championships. I'm, too, I'm sure that the two were unconnected. Mm. According to SPICE, the bill aims to provide the representation of women in non-executive posts mm. on public boards, and it sets a target for public boards in terms of the gender representation objective, that women should make up at least 50% of non-executive board members. Now, in some instances, this may mean that a woman is chosen over a man if and only if they are equally qualified. But as fellow members of the LGBTI community in here know fine well, we don't all start from a level playing field. If we did, then men like Harvey Weinstein would not exist. Across the water in Fife, NHS board membership is comprised of five men, five women, and how could I forget, a female chair in the form of the Right Honourable Trisha Marwick. Fife College's board is relatively similar with seven men, eight, uh, seven women rather, eight men and a male chair. Critics could and have argued today that the situation isn't really that bad and we don't really need legislation to fix something which isn't broken. Indeed, as Alexander Stewart, who's not in the chamber, but as he did comment at stage one, Women uh, currently make up 45.8% of the membership of public boards, but account for only 34.9% of members of the Scottish Parliament. That raises the question of whether quotas are the right way to tackle the root cause of gender inequality. But as Alex Cohamilton argued, this bill has nothing to do with quotas. Indeed, this argument misses the point entirely, because all it takes is a change in membership, or indeed another election, to impact on any organisation's equality credentials. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure I don't need to remind Mr Stewart and his Conservative colleagues of his party's dismal record when it comes to female representation, with only 19% of their MSP group being women and just over 20% of their MPs. That is simply not good enough for the party of opposition, or indeed of government. Indeed, as Annie Wells herself commented during the Stage 1 debate, at the most basic level, those in positions of power in Scotland should reflect the, soci the society that we seek to represent. Presiding officer, I agree with Annie Wells. This bill will make Scotland the only part of the UK with requirements for gender parity on public boards. It is a step in the right direction. And as Gail Ross said, no one's saying it's a panacea, but it is a start. And we should also remember that the government is limited by the powers of this parliament. As the cabinet secretary said last November, with our current powers, we have legislative competence and ability only in relation to public sector boards. So we are limited in terms of the powers of this parliament to fully progress gender representation. Imagine the possibilities if we had more powers. Presiding officer, we should not forget in this debate about the sexual harassment allegations which rocked Holyrood to its core at the end of 2017. The corporate body has now been dragged into the 21st century as a result. The Deputy First Minister set a precedent by stepping up and responding as the most senior male member of the Scottish Government at the time. He said the conduct and behaviour of men needs to change if we are to end the sexual harassment and abuse of women, whether that be in their workplace, their social life or in their home. Sexual harassment is about a power imbalance. Mm -hmm. And for sexual harassment to flourish, all you need is to create the conditions mm -hmm. which enable inequality. It happens in this building every single day. 
all male witness panels, women paid less than men, a parliamentary committee with 10 male members and one female MSP who is sat beside me. This legislation will be pivotal in tackling societal structures which prevent women from fully contributing to the wider civic life of our country. Presiding officer, I heard the Cabinet Secretary um, address a room full of women at the Scottish Women's Convention event on sexual harassment two weeks ago in Glasgow. She described this as a watershed moment in Scottish politics. She said, I hope we seize it. This is what today's legislation is about. Time's up. Thank you. Kezia Dugdale, followed by Claire Adamson. Thank you, President Officer, and like others, can I welcome the opportunity to speak in what is a very important debate and a very significant law that I hope that we're going to pass at decision time tonight and put on record my thanks to all the organisations and groups who fed into the committee process and indeed have fought for decades to get us where we are today. It is, of course, a, a very welcome law and it's one that the Women 5050 campaign, which I'm a co-founder with, Alison Johnson, has been fighting for. This is one of the three things that we exist to do and we're pleased to tick it off today. So I would say that represents the end of the beginning rather than the end itself. And if I needed any reminder of that, I only have to look to the evidence that was given to the Economy Committee this morning, where we learned that the Scottish Government spends £2 billion every year on economic development, but just £400,000 of that goes towards women in enterprise. It reminds us of how important it is to have a balance of gender in our decision making to make decisions that reflect women and the needs of wider society. When we pass laws, they really have two purposes. They are either symbolic and there to drive cultural change, or they're there to have a practical effect around some existing injustice. I think this bill does both of these things for two reasons. First of all, it's symbolic because it sends out a message that gender equality is good business, but it will also have a practical effect because it will overcome the existing inequality in the compositions of our boards. But in order to make sure that that actually happens, and these are points that I know and gender have made to the Cabinet Secretary, we need really, really good guidance, and we need that guidance to be in a statutory footing, and we need it to be well understood. So as welcome as today's bill is, we need to make sure that the desire to make it work in practice continues after today. And I know that the Cabinet Secretary will offer that leadership as she has done up to this point so far. In the time that I've got, presiding officer, I want to tackle some of the consistent arguments against this bill that I've heard. And I've heard them mostly from the Conservative benches, and I'm sick to the back teeth of them, and they need to be faced down. The first group is around the whataboutery that this bill faces. The idea that if we are going to address gender, why are we not doing anything about race or disability or sexuality? There is no hierarchy of inequality in society. But I'm not going to stand here and stand for any suggestion that we should hold back the progress of women because we're not doing enough for disabled communities or for people of a different colour or people of a different religion. We do not set groups who are unequal against each other. That is not what progress constitutes, but that's somehow the argument that we're hearing from the Tories today. Neither does it mean that the solutions for those other underrepresented groups are also quotas or targets. We're not here today to suggest that we should apply quotas to people with disabilities or indeed race. The solutions to increasing representation of those groups are very complex and they should demand our parliamentary time. But what we are talking about today is the historic underrepresentation of women in positions of power. And we have an opportunity to address that today and the Tory benches should take it. The other thing that the Tory benches need to recognise that women are also black, they are also disabled and they are also LGBTI. So in progressing more women into these positions, we are actually diversifying our boards in the roundest possible sense. And if we want to pick a fight about protected characteristics and whether we should set one against the other, what about all the other disadvantaged groups in society that we're not talking about? What about carers? What about care experienced young people? What about class and socio-demographics like that? How are we going to make sure that we address those underrepresented groups when it comes to the composition of our boards? But there are other arguments that the Tories make against this bill. And time and time again, we've heard one today. We want equality, just not now. And then you push them to say what they're going to do about it, and the answer is nothing. We also at stage one heard the argument from the Tories that they made it against the odds, so why can't everyone else? Sometimes we also hear an argument for the Tories that what we need is some sort of free market when it comes to the representation of women in public life. But they seem to misunderstand that we do not exist in a free market just now because the status quo is skewed towards the advantage of men. And what we're trying to do with this legislation is to create the free market whereby merit and people of skill can get to the top and that's how we tackle the institutional barriers that women ultimately face. 
The other thing that we've heard from the Tories, and we heard this uh, right at the start in the stage one debate, is we should just do more on the structural roots of women's inequality, childcare, flexible work, access to education, as if it's the Tories that have the answer to these problems. It's the Tories who argue against resources for our local authorities which provide the childcare. It's the Tories who argue against zero hour contracts and regulations to curtail that and the impact it has on women. And it's the Tories who will attack bursaries for students in further and higher education that are needed to help women access the education that they need. Presiding officer, in closing, I think it's important to pick up one small part of Christina McKelvey's contribution, the one area where I disagreed with her, where she said that there are no losers in this bill. I'm afraid Christina McKelvey is wrong. There are some losers in this bill. They are middle class, middle aged, white men who have had power for far too long. Perhaps that's why the Tories are against this bill. The last of the open debate contributions is from Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I can, would also like to add my thanks to the committee for their extensive work in this area. Um, last week, I, I was very upset as one of my um, feminist heroes um, passed away. Um, Ursula Le Guin was a, an American author who grew up um, the daughter of a, an American anthropologist who taught at Berkeley surrounded by intellect, surrounded by scientists, and sur surrounded by um, First Nation friends of her family. And it, it gave her a unique position in actually challenging cultural norms, something she did throughout her um, writing career. And the New York Times said of her, the immensely popular author who brought li literary depth and a tough-minded feminist sensibility to science fiction and fantasy. Last week, someone posted a note that she responded to on being asked to um, write the foreword to a collection of new fantasy short stories. And I have a quote from her, she says, I can imagine myself blurbing a book in which Brian Aldous predictably sneers at my work because then I could preen myself on my magnanimity. But I cannot imagine myself blurbing a book the first of a new series, and hence presumably an exemplary of the series, the tone of which is so self-contentedly, exclusively male, like a club or like a locker room, that I would not be, that would not be magnanimity, but foolishness. Gentlemen, I just don't belong here, Ursula Ligon. It struck me how prescient that was, talking about the locker room long before Trump's infamous comment about it and just mentioning like a gentleman's club when we've just had the scandal of the president's club. And it brought it home to me that although that was in 1987, how far we have come in some ways, but how far we have still to come when it, uh, to go when it comes to women's representation and equality in our society. Now, a few people this afternoon have mentioned that um, some of the bill, they, they object to some of the bill because of its subjective nature, completely forgetting that where we... Uh, excuse me, Ms. Adamson, oh, your microphone had gone off. Gone off. It's okay. back on again, if you'd like to perhaps go back to the start of that sentence. OK. Um, a, a few people this afternoon have talked about the subjective nature of the bill, um, completely forgetting the, the position we are in has been about subjectivity up until now, and my colleague Gail Ross mentioned unconscious bias. If anyone doesn't consider how important unconscious bias is, then they're denying the situation that we live in today. It's a science. We can actually see unconscious bias in the brain when people are um, uh, undergoing experiments in this area. In 2012, Mohsen Rakusen, um, did a, a piece of work, uh, research, where they um, put forward applications for science positions that were reviewed. They were identical uh, in every respect, apart from the gender and name of the applicant. The science faculties were more likely to rate male candidates better qualified than the female candidates, want to hire the male candidates rather than the female candidates, give the male candidate a higher starting salary than the female candidate, and be willing to invest more in the development of the male candidate than the female candidate. This is unconscious bias that has an impact 
not in the final stages of a woman's career reaching the boardroom, but at every single position they are in throughout their career. And it's understanding this is, is, is where we're going to make a difference in what happens. When it comes to the, the creative industries, orchestras have undergone a similar exercise where um, with um, introducing blind auditions in orchestras has seen an increase to almost 48% in some of the world's major orchestras of women's representation coming from a really, really low base. And this bias affects not just what we do in the boardroom, but every aspect of our life. Does it affect a grant application, a European research council application for research money? Does it affect the, the way women are judged in, on the screen or in, in other aspects of life? And this is what comes to the, the crux of this, is that everything we are doing is, sub, is, is subjective and part of our culture. And it's challenging that culture that we are doing today that is so, so important. It isn't a panacea. We know it's not a panacea, and that's been remarked many, many times. What it is, is a measure of leadership in this area. It's putting down a marker that, uh, while we understand and know what the barriers for women getting on in all aspects of life are, that this is no longer acceptable in one area where we do have a control of, and we can influence that decision. So today, the message that I hope comes out from passing this bill this afternoon, which I fully support, is that women belong. They belong in the boardroom, they belong in every aspect of public life, and they belong in our industries and in our commerce. And if that's what comes out of today, I will be extremely happy. Thank you very much, President. Officer. We now move to the closing speeches and I call on Rhoda Grant. Around six minutes, please, Ms Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, this was a really good debate um, this afternoon and hopefully this bill is another step in the journey towards equal representation for women. It seems strange that as we approach the centenary of votes, the women's right to vote, uh, we still have these battles about gender equality and I wonder how long it will take before we stop having to intervene and that true equality will be the norm. As Monica Lennon said, and I share her pride that we in the Scottish Labour Party use positive action to encourage women into politics and that creates more equal representation. How we ha however, we have to continue this year on year. It's the only way to embed it into practice. We don't just need women on boards, we need them in all key positions. Despite advances made in the number of women in boards, we are still falling way behind in key positions such as the chairperson of the boards, where women only make up 25% of these key positions on regulated boards. People have talked about merit this afternoon. If appointments to public boards were already made on merit, we wouldn't be passing this legislation today. Public boards would already reflect the communities they serve. If you also follow that argument through to its conclusion, that appointments are made on merit, it follows that you also believe that women have less merit than men, because if they were equal in merit, they would already have equal gender representation on boards. Alison Johnston also talked about um, how appointments had not been made on merit. They have been made on the basis of male positive discrimination. People appoint people, often unintentionally, in their own image. Like appoints like, and until you have positive action, you will never overcome this because men in suits will appoint men in suits. We all do it. People who look like us, who we can relate to, immediately form a bond, and, that, that, and those that are markedly different do not. People tend to work against positive action to fight discrimination are often those who lose their place, their entitlement, which has been unfairly gained by dint of their gender. I can assure you that there are many women who merit appointment who are better qualified than men that, that they would replace if only were, they were given the same opportunity. And I think Claire Adamson's example just then about blind auditions for orchestras showing that gender balance where it is made based on fair criteria can be achieved without any bias at all. 
uh, an area where male bias was very much in operation up until the point of the blind trials. I also want, as many speakers in the debate have done, is pay tribute to Mary Fee and her amendments at stage two to ensure that the bill is inclusive of trans women. And Mary rightly paid tribute to the work of Trans Alliance and the other organisations that have brought this to her attention at stage two. And we as elected representatives depend on stakeholders to bring issues to our attention. And this is how people can influence and improve legislation that goes through the Parliament. Members have also talked about the Women 5050 campaign. Monica Lennon paid tribute to, to this campaign, co-founded by Kezia Dugdale, Alison Johnston and Talent Yakub, and indeed others. Women who fight for equal representation. This is not party political. It's a, it, it, it impacts on all women and it shows that women working together can actually make a huge difference. A lot of members talked about the benefits that this bill will bring, not just in getting women into their rightful place, but actually the greater benefits to society, that boards will reflect all of us as a society, that they will have a much broader base of experience and knowledge, that they will be able to lead the way in making change. And I think it was Alison Johnston that talked about the impacts of cuts disproportionately impacting on women, and I think Kezia Dugdale said that as well. If there were more women making those decision, decisions, those impacts would be much less and would be gender sensitive in that those cuts would be, if we had to have them at all, would be born uh, fairly across society and not just uh, on those that are less able to fight for themselves. Um, Alec Cole Hamilton talked about um, his amendment and indeed others paid tribute to his work, stage two, about the tiebreaker, what was concerned could be a tiebreaker provision and how he was very clear um, that other protected characteristics had to be looked after and that this bill should not um, harm people um, due to or, or lessen their chances due to their ethnicity or indeed disability and looking at some of the statistics uh, we see that um, women's representation is um, increasing um, the representation of um, people from other ethnic origins is increasing but sadly we see that people with disabilities representation on public boards is falling and this is something we really need to challenge because it, it shows huge disparities and it's quite sad that we came from maybe quite a, a, a high point in that and are dropping. So I think it is very important that we deal with this. The bill also requires people to take positive action to encourage women um, to come forward. And that is like making sure boards are family friendly, that caring responsibilities are taken into account and the like. Things that make it much easier for women to step up and take on those roles. But what is most important is that women see other women in those roles and that they know that those roles are open to them because of that. And presiding officer, we're supporting the bill because it will make a difference. The Conservatives appear unclear whether they're against the bill because it will do nothing at all or whether it will do too much. We don't share that view. We hope it goes some way to redress discrimination that women face and make sure that all our public boards are more reflective of our society and that by passing this legislation, we lead by example. I call Jamie Green. Around seven minutes, please, Mr Green. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, may I start by thanking Alison Harris uh, for stepping in today to assist my uh, colleague uh, Annie Wells. In fact, there's a little bit of me today that also secretly hoped I had laryngitis oh. in this debate. Um, because, uh, quite simply, it's never easy in a debate like this uh, to be the white, somewhat middle-aged, arguably middle-class man <laughs> who is tasked with the job to speak about a bill which seeks to address gender inequality and representation on our public boards. But nonetheless, it is important that bills which pass through this parliament are given due scrutiny and that all sides of the argument are given the opportunity to share their views and thoughts in a respectful manner. And we also have a duty to properly scrutinize legislation on whether it meets the objectives of the policy behind it 
and will not create any unintended consequences once it is passed. Now, I made it clear in stage one of this debate on the subject that it was our intention to work constructively with members throughout the bill process, and we actively participated in stage two proceedings in committee. Uh, on that, I thank those who responded to the consultation and presented evidence to the committee. I did listen with interest. Also today on these benches, we did not use any of our votes against any of the useful and constructive amendments to the bill in the spirit of allow allowing the legislation to be tidied up in its current form. But one doesn't need to be a mathematician to see that there is majority support for the concept of this bill, and it will come as no surprise that our position on this has been clear throughout and has not changed. <clears throat> but it's not just the party's view that there should not be statutory targets. It is also the view of individual members of our party, including our female MSPs who I consulted with, and I value their opinion on this. Now, the Cabinet Secretary opened uh, today's debate by stating that this bill is very much about the message that it gives off. But the problem, Deputy Presiding Officer, is that legislation also has consequences. It is not just symbolic, it becomes law. And I think what this argument comes down to is not so much about whether we as a parliament want to see more diversity in our public boards, but about how this can be best achieved and whether this specific, and it is specific, a narrow piece of legislation is going to help us achieve that. The argument, if I could make some progress first, the argument over whether organic change is suffice or whether government and therefore the law needs to intervene is one that plays out not just in Scotland, but in many countries. And it is our view that legislation is not required. I'm happy to take an intervention. Christina McKelvey. Thanks very much, President Officer, and thank you, Jamie Green, for taking the intervention. Jamie Green saying that this bill won't address any of these issues. If not this bill, can the Conservatives' Party please tell us today what they think would achieve the result that we want? Jamie Green. I think there's a, uh, it's a very, a, a very decent question to ask. There are a wide range of things <laughs> that we as a parliament and indeed the other uh, parliament of uh, the UK should be looking at to address uh, inequality across society. Uh, and I'm going to come on to some of the specific issues that the bill does not address, uh, because I think it's important to identify what this bill does not do rather than imagine what we think it does. And I also think it's important to state that things are not as depicted or suggested in the chamber today about whether we on these benches want more equality or not. I think that's an oversimplification of the issue. Now, being anti-quota is not the same as being anti-equality. Anyone who knows me will know that I go out of my way as a politician and a parliamentarian to promote equality in Scotland. And much of the debate has been given over whether this bill contains a quota or not. And the point has been made is that there cannot be positive discrimination so in that respect, the bill says that appointing persons have a duty to take steps to meet the objectives of the bill and report on their actions and decisions. But we are at stage three of this bill, still discussing the lack of clarity over whether the provisions of this bill are for voluntary or mandatory targets. If it is not a quota, what is it? It has long been our view that using mandatory targets or quotas as sticking plasters will distract us from tackling the underlying problems as to why there is not greater diversity on boards. Uh, if I could make some progress. And whilst members might like to think that the bill is about symbolism and messaging, the problem is that its narrow focus on gender balance does not do the wider diversity issue any justice. This bill goes no, goes no way to address the problem of the, uh, for example, uh, of the continuous pipeline of female candidates that will be required to meet the needs of such a wide and diverse range of public boards. Many, many of the, six, I believe, 69 public boards to which this bill will be affected are traditionally light in female representation in their general workplaces. The bill does not seek to address that. It does not address the problem of how we nurture and develop opportunities for women in those industries and in management positions. It is also worth taking note of where we are today, given the context of the bill. In 2013-2014, women made up 35% of public board members. By last September, that number stood at 45.8%. Now, I appreciate that as a snapshot in time, 
but it is also a trend and a trajectory. And there must be underlying reasons why this trajectory has been positive. Good work is undoubtedly already being done in our public boards. Now, I've heard the argument that legislation is required because we need to future-proof uh, in case of future regression. But instead, what we have created is a backstop where the focus is upon achieving a numerical percentage rather than address the bigger picture. It goes nowhere to address how the management and executive arms of our public bodies will see greater gender imbalance. Nor does it seek to address the wider issue of other characteristics being underrepresented on uh, public boards as well. My worry is that this bill as drafted is somewhat of a box stick exercise. If we felt that as a parliament government intervention was required to ensure diverse public boards, then argu arguably this debate should have been about diversity on public boards. I'm in my closing uh, seconds. Regardless of whether or not you agree with the principle of this legislation, we have a, an important duty to pass legislation which is watertight. And this uh, bill in its current form could throw up a range of legal issues. The bill does not, for example, address a number of issues which uh, discourage women from entering public boards and participate in the non-executive aspects of those public boards either. In closing, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, the Scottish Conservatives will always champion gender equality and believe and believe that there should be no barriers to women achieving the very highest levels in public office. I think the heckling is a disservice to the good work that my female MSP colleagues on these benches has done on this. Where we differ though, is in our approach that this bill is taking. It is narrow, it is too focused, and it is too subjective in its wording. And for that reason, we are unable to support it this afternoon. I call Angela Constance. Will you take us up to 10 to 5, please, Cabinet Secretary? Thank you very much, President Officer. There's been some great contributions this afternoon, a particularly thoughtful contribution from Claire Adamson and a particularly feisty contribution uh, from Kezia Dugdale, to, to name but just a few. The young uh, Malala Yousafzai was particularly insightful beyond her years when she said, we cannot all succeed uh, when half of us are held back. And despite being nearly 52% uh, of the population, women uh, in Scotland today are underrepresented on our public boards or are quite simply missing from decision-making positions. And throughout the debate, we've been reminded of the causes and consequences of women's collective uh, lack of power and influence. So the, pay, the price of change, the price of no change, it has to be uh, entirely unacceptable. Now, with regards to the Conservatives, I started my opening remarks by saying that in my view, uh, the Tories had completely missed the point uh, of the bill and as a consequence, it had missed uh, the moment. They have, of course, opposed the bill from the, the very start. They have brought forward uh, no amendments uh, at stage uh, two. And here we are at stage three. They have decided that they have become obsessed with technicalities. And of course, there were very important uh, stage two amendments around strengthening the guidance uh, and indeed strengthening uh, reporting requirements, particularly uh, upon ministers. And they keep using the phrase quotas, which I think is the best example of how they, at best, have misunderstood the point of this bill. Because quotas are about fixed proportions. This bill seeks uh, to bring in a gender representative uh, objective uh, where women are underrepresented. There is quite uh, a significant difference because you can't select a woman to a position on a public board quite simply because she's a woman, because that would be discriminatory and positive discrimination is indeed prohibited uh, by EU law. And of course, parliamentary process would not permit uh, me uh, to bring forward uh, legislation that would not be compliant with the various uh, safeguards that we all have to comply with. And while it is not custom, customary for ministers to talk about uh, legal advice, 
But just if I could point out, you know, some of the processes uh, around the Scottish Government legal department, around the presiding officer's uh, role in legislation, around committee scrutiny and around, you know, the Lord Advocate and, and indeed uh, the Officer uh, of the Advocate General. And I think to come to stage three and imply somehow that our legislation is inadequate or indeed unlawful is shameful and points to people who have not done their homework or indeed perhaps been awake throughout proceedings because they've also got the cheek to complain about there not being any sanctions associated uh, with this bill. But if they'd been awake, they would have been alert to that debate they would have been alert to the fact that neither the committee nor indeed the Equalities and Human Rights Commission it recommended sanctions. And I am confident, presiding officer, that this bill will work because I am confident for many reasons, one of which is that public authorities will indeed comply with the law and for the avoidance of doubt, Crown Estate uh, is subject to this legislation and is specifically mentioned uh, in Schedule 1. I am confident that the public sector will build on the progress they've made thus far and work harder to tap into the talents of the majority of our population. I am confident that our public sector will follow the guidance uh, that is issued by this parliament. I am confident that the public sector will uh, pay heed to this legislation and report on their progress, as will ministers report on progress. And indeed, we will be accountable to this place. And I don't believe any part of our public sector that is subject to this bill would risk the reputational damage of not complying with the law of this land. And what we've been reminded of time and time again by Christina McKelvey and others is that the Tories have failed to say what action they would support. They have failed to say what action they would support that we are not currently undertaking. Because I've got news for you, we currently are undertaking reform and a revolution in early learning and childcare with our STEM strategy, with developing Scotland's young workforce, with the work that we are doing around gender stereotyping, with the world leading work around tackling violence against women and girls and indeed promoting uh, flexible working. So not just now, if it's not this bill, what? And if it's not now, when? And the lack of progress, perhaps Rachel Hamilton can answer this, the lack of progress in the private sector is most certainly not an argument against this bill. Rachel Hamilton. Thank you, Deputy Pres uh, Presiding Officer. Would the Cabinet Secretary like to comment on the college statistics today that show the um, number of uh, enrolments in college places from women has dropped by 47% as opposed to 25 since the SNP came into power? Yeah, yeah. Cabinet Secretary. Well, uh, the last time I looked at statistics, I wasn't aware that women were underrepresented in terms of the makeup of college uh, students. But perhaps Rachel Hamilton, uh, who quite sidely uh, shifted uh, the issue uh, from um, using the private sector and their underperformance in terms of gender equality as a reason uh, not to support this bill. I wonder if the Scottish Conservatives would support then the Scottish Government in seeking additional legislative competence uh, over the private sector to allow legislation uh, on women's representation in private sector boards because they have spoken a lot about private sector boards without seemingly uh, appearing to realise that we don't have legal competence uh, over corporation law or indeed uh, employment law. And Alexander Stewart made what I can say is an interesting contribution about leading women. Well, I hate to remind him, there's never been a woman who's been a UN Secretary General. There's never been a woman who's been Governor of the Bank of England. Mark Carney is the 120th man to hold that position since 1694. There's never been a woman Secretary of State for Defence. There's never been a woman President of the USA. And women are still underrepresented in this Parliament, in local government, and indeed uh, in the private sector. And presiding officer, by introducing 
this legal requirement for a gender representation objective, we will indeed drive change across the public sector where we have powers because we will improve recruitment methods, making organisations work harder to find the most talented women and men to sit uh, on our public boards. There is absolutely nothing in this bill that prevents action to promote wider diversity on boards. And indeed, the Scottish Government accepted uh, an amendment from Alex Cole Hamilton which stated this, I quote, for the avoidance of doubt. And Christina McKelvey, Kezia Dugdale and others spoke about how the advancement of women is indeed good for other people who have protected characteristics. Because after all, uh, women are not some uh, monogamous group. And there is work that we're doing to improve that, that broader uh, diversity <laughs> with our public appointments. Uh, improvement programme. Uh, the Scottish Government has equality outcomes uh, to improve diversity with a focus on age. We don't have enough young people sitting on our public boards and we do indeed need to address the underrepresentation of the BME community and people with uh, a disability. Presiding officer, this bill is simply seeking to redress the underrepresentation uh, of women in our public boards, ensuring that women's voices are heard where and when it matters so they can shape services and they can shape decisions. Public bodies, colleges, universities touch on every aspect of people's lives and they touch on every aspect of women's lives. So women's voices need to be heard and women's voices it must be heard. And we know that the greater diversity that we have in boardrooms, that that leads to uh, improved performance. And yes, I say to Jamie Green, we have made good progress. 45% of positions uh, of public appointments uh, are indeed women, but surely the history of this parliament demonstrates that you need to lock in progress and make sure there's no complacency and no uh, backsliding. Presiding officer, I want to end with a quote from Cheryl Sandberg when she said, a truly equal world would be one where women run half the countries and where women run half the companies and where men run half of our homes. So we know that this bill may not be a panacea for every aspect of women's inequality, but it is a very important step forward for a fairer Scotland and, of course, to shatter the glass ceiling for once and for all. Uh, with this bill, we are implementing our new powers. We're implementing our new powers to make a difference by ensuring that women's voices are no longer missing and are fairly heard and represented in public boards because it's not just the right thing to do, it's the smart thing to do. And of course, as many members have reflected upon this afternoon, there is also a bigger picture and that if we all put our shoulder to the wheel, this bill in this important year of the centenary of the women's suffrage could indeed be the catalyst for further change. It could be the catalyst for equal representation in other areas of society and life. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes our debate on stage three of the Gender Representation on Public Board Scotland Bill. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 10198 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a revised business programme for Thursday. I would ask any member who objects to say so now. I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion 10198. Formally moved. Thank you very much. No member has asked to speak against the motion. The question therefore is that motion 10198 is agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Now, I'm now minded to accept a motion without notice to bring forward decision time to now. Could I ask the Minister if he'll move such a motion? Moved. Thank you very much. The question is that decision time is brought forward to now. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. There's one question as a result of today's business. The question is, and, and because this is a stage three uh, final vote on a bill, we'll need to move straight to a division. The question is that motion 10159 in the name of Angela Constance on the gender representation on public boards Scotland bill at stage three be agreed. Members should cast their votes now.
The result of the vote on motion 10159 in the name of Angela Constance is yes 88, no 28. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed and the gender representation on Public Board Scotland Bill is passed. Thank you, and that concludes decision time. We'll move now to members' business in the name of Joanne Lamont, and we'll just take a few moments for members to change seats.